All right, turn in your Bibles to Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we are in the section, this is the outline of the whole book of Matthew. You've already gotten this down somewhere, so don't, you don't feel like I have to copy it again. Um, we are in segment 3, uh, I'm sorry, segment 2, the gospel of the kingdom, and we're going to be in chapter 4. Last week we ended with the temptation of the Lord Jesus, and uh, we got into some questions, they were really good questions. By the way, I went back and watched uh, that segment on YouTube. It's there. It's a really, it's good. Avail yourself of all the stuff that's on YouTube on our page. Uh, but I was reminded once again that nobody can hear your questions when you ask them. And so it's like I'm answering nothing. I'm just like answering these random questions. So if you will help me remember to repeat your question. Uh, I should remember, I, I've tried to log it into my head, and so I'm going to repeat it, because I'm mic'd, and you're not mic'd, and so I'll try, to, I'll try to do that. But if I forget to do that, somebody just remind me, hey, Pastor, repeat it, and I'll do that. Uh, yeah, point to your ear or something, and I'll repeat it, because it's, uh, it's helpful for the, for the continuity of the session if they can actually hear the question that's made. So I'll try to do that. Um, so, Matthew chapter 4, we, we got into a great uh, discussion about Jesus' uh, temptation, and we ended it with whether he could sin or not. And uh, I tried to encourage you, I, I told Brother Larry, um, there have been great theologians, smarter than me, who have spent their whole lives on the it's, called the, it's called the peccability or the impeccability of Christ. Is Christ could Christ have sinned or not sinned? Um, it wasn't Brother Larry, it was Brother Charles. We were talking about that, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, weather, and, and we don't have time to exhaust it because the Bible doesn't discuss it. And that's why I just said at the end of the day, what matters is that he was really tempted and he really didn't sin. Both of those are what really matter. Um, I tend to err on the side that he couldn't have, but it doesn't really we don't know. The Bible doesn't spell it out like that for us. And so it's better for us just to realize that it was a, it was a real temptation so that we could say he was tempted in all points of we are, as we were, yet without sin. And then, so it was real, and he, and he succeeded. He never sinned in word, thought, deed, or omission. Um, there was nothing that Jesus ever did that was wrong. And so... Um, I try, to, I, I try to remember that. So that's where we ended. So pick up with me in verse number 12, Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to read the rest of this chapter, and then we're going to, we're, we're going to move through these first two sections, or the, I mean the second and third, the gospel of the kingdom and the authority of Jesus and the expansion of the kingdom. We're going to see how far we get with that. Um, by the way, I don't plan to spend as much time in Mark, Luke, uh, like I am in Matthew, uh, we'll, just, uh, we'll just compare those two Gospels to, um, to Matthew's when we get there. So don't think this is going to take 40 forevers th the way I'm going through Matthew. I I'm just establishing some, um, really establishing the Gospel of the Lord Jesus in Matthew. And then in Luke, uh, I mean in Mark and Luke, we'll go fairly quickly through those. John will spend a little bit more time. He does a little different than the, uh, than the synoptics. So, uh, pay attention to God's Word. Matthew chapter 5, starting verse number 12, God's Word says this, Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. 
Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boats and their father and followed him. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pain, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So, let me tell you, uh, let me take out, look at your handout just for a second, and you're going to see an outline there at the top. I'm using that. That's what I'm going to attempt to cover today. I'm doing this as a way for you to take notes better. So the space after number six uh, or sub point number six, it, that space there is just for you to write notes and write notes all over the page. And then the supplemental reading begins there at the bottom and continues to the back page. And I just have two excerpts uh, for that. But what I, want, what I want to draw your attention to is what I'm outlining is not Jesus's ministry. And so when we talk about the gospel of the kingdom in chapters 3 to 7, and then Jesus's authority in expanding the kingdom in chapters 8 through 11, we're not talking about these are segments in Jesus's ministry, like he is doing this, and now he's doing this, and now he's doing this. What we're talking about are, is the way that Matthew put together his rendition of the gospel. Okay, so, so when we outline these books, we're not saying these are the li this is the life of Jesus segmented in this way. What we're saying is this is the way that the gospel writer, in this case Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is presenting Jesus' ministry. And so I believe that this outline um, underscores Matthew's intention of his writing. So I think Matthew is doing this on purpose, but I think Jesus' life, he, he lived his life. Now, Jesus lived his life on purpose, but it wasn't segmented like this. It was one fluid life. I mean, he, uh, he healed people at the same time that he preached, at the same time that he was coming to be the propitiation for our sins. So he's doing all this at the same time. Um, but, the, but the gospel writers, because just the way we have to think through things, they had to order it in some way. And this is the way they ordered it. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I, I, I just don't want, to, I don't want to lead you to believe that Jesus' life was all chopped up like this. It wasn't. But this is the way. Um, so, so Matthew took five um, teachings of Jesus and built his story of Jesus around that, and that's what we're looking at. Does that, that help? Okay, good. So here we go. Let's, let's look at this. The first thing we see is the gospel of the kingdom. We looked at this last week. We talked about the baptizer's ministry uh, last, or two weeks ago. We talked about the baptism of Jesus two weeks ago and the temptation of Jesus two weeks ago. Today, Jesus begins his ministry. Notice that the beginning of Jesus's ministry was at the end of John's ministry. They really didn't overlap. The only overlap was the baptism. And then John went to prison. Remember, John himself said, I must decrease so that he might increase. This wasn't just a neat saying by John, although it is a neat saying, and it's a good maxim to live by. We ought to decrease so that Jesus increases in our life. But this really happened in the in the life of John. John left the scene so that Jesus could arrive on the scene. And so don't, don't miss that little verse number 12, that this is the launch of Jesus's public ministry is when John went to prison. And so it's, a, it's an exchange. The forerunner leaves and the Messiah enters. That's what, that's what we have happening. So Jesus begins his ministry. Let's do this. Nope. So Jesus begins his ministry, and uh, we see several things um, uh, in this. He began his ministry there. Uh, by the way, pay attention to Matthew. I told you that Matthew is all about fulfillment. Remember, that's one of the themes. 
Notice here, even again, he said he left Nazareth and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea. And then he told us something that we don't care anything about in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, all we know, in fact, some of us don't even know that Zebulun and Naphtali are two tribes of, of, uh, of Israel, right? And you say, oh, we all know that. No, because every year we sit around Cora's table in our staff, in our staff meeting, and she asks us to name the 12 tribes of Israel, and Naphtali is always the one we forget. <laughs> and so, uh, we, uh, we can name them all. We sit around and count on our hands and name them, and we always forget Naphtali. So, we don't really care about Naphtali and Zebulun. Um, I had friends who lived in Macon, Georgia on Zebulun Road. And so, th before I knew that Zebulun was one of the tribes, I knew it was a road in Macon, Georgia. But Zebulun and Naphtali, the whole reason he tells us this is because then he goes and he quotes the Old Testament from Isaiah. And he says, this was, to, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Remember, Matthew's goal is to connect the dots. He's connecting the dots, and that's what he does right here. Jesus goes to Galilee in the region of Naphtali and Zebulun, and this was to fulfill what, uh, what Isaiah said. And so, th th that's what we see, Jesus beginning his ministry. We also see that Jesus reveals his method for the kingdom his method for the kingdom, and that's in verses 18 to 22. In fact, the second excerpt reading, uh, external reading, is from the master plan of evangelism uh, by a guy named Robert Coleman. Now, if you've never read that book, The Master Plan of Evangelism, you ought to go get it. It's a little paperback, but it's, it demonstrates that Jesus's plan for expanding the kingdom was always to be through disciple making, through, through disciples who make disciples. And that's what Jesus does. Remember, Jesus preaches to the crowds, but that's not where his ministry was. He preached to the crowds, but he revealed himself fully to that inner circle. And the reason is, it's outlined in that excerpt, I'll let you read it later, but the reason he does it is he knew that when he left, he needed to leave people in charge. And those people trained up other people who trained up other people who trained up other people. And it was through those 11 other people and, and others that the whole world was turned upside down. And friends, I, I, this is a, an aside, but I think we've lost that. And because we've lost it, we're struggling with being witnesses in our in our. Uh, in our, our own culture. I think that we have to get it back. We're so busy with the crowds. I mean, how do we count? I mean, how, how many are you running? Well, we run about 250. How many are you run? You know, it's all about the crowds, and we really ought to be investing ourselves in the people who are going to carry it out further. By the way, it's what this is about. It's why I, it's why I give as much time as I can to teaching smaller groups it's because we need to replicate ourselves. We have, to, we have to make sure that there are people behind us to do this. Uh, I know this is during the middle of the day, and so I know that this crowd represents the middle of the day people, which means mainly people who are retired. So I understand that. But in 20 years, this group is not going to be here. This group is going to be in heaven with Jesus in 20 years. And we better have a group like this that is still here. But the only way we do it is by replicating ourselves. We have, to, we have to make disciples. And so that's what Jesus is doing. It's important that we see this. You're going to see this idea of Jesus dealing with disciples throughout. And in fact, we see it even into the, the book of Acts. That, that's where we see Jesus' plan really take off. Because if you think about it, just, just think about Jesus' life as an individual. I'm not talking about his glorious resurrection. Let's leave the resurrection out just for a second. If you see Jesus' life, you see that he had three years of ministry, and by the end of it, all of those crowds had left him. All right, that's, that's the story of Jesus from the from the guru perspective, that he was just some teacher who came along and led a little, a little revival for a little while. But that's not the extent of Jesus's ministry. Jesus rose again from the dead. Um, 
uh, beginning, the age that is to come. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. So he, he launched that with his own resurrection. But then we see that his teaching over who he was and what he did expanded through all of these people so that the whole world was, was evangelized and still being evangelized. It's happening right now. And so Jesus's life certainly wasn't um, a failure. It would have been, though, if it was only about him. If it was only about him and the crowds, it would have been a failure. But that's not what it was about. He invested in people who invested in people who invested in people, and it spread around the world. And so this is, this is the, the ministry of Jesus. Uh, by the way, that was all from a human standpoint about who Jesus is. Just understand that that's part, I mean, often we run to his deity, which we ought to. It's part, I mean, it is who he is. But also, he had a very real human impact. He is the quintessential human led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit as well. Okay, so he does both of those equally well all at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Robert Coleman. It's on your, it's on your page. Uh, flip, it out, flip over that page and look at the very bottom, the last sentence that's on there, or the last thing, that's who it is, master, the master plan of evangelism. Um, and so then we have Matthew giving us a summary of Jesus's ministry, verses 23 to 25. This is just a summary of that early part of his ministry. I'll read it again. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, so this is how he's doing it. This is what he's doing. He's going throughout all Galilee, so he's traveling around. He's teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, so it's expanding. This, hey, there's this guy who's going around Galilee, he's healing people. And so they brought to him, so people started to flock to him. This is the crowds, they're starting to come, and they're bringing the ill, the, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And so they're all gathering to him. By the way, what he's preaching around is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's his message. And so we're about to see that message fleshed out, all put together as we go into the Sermon on the Mount. But remember what he's calling them to do. And this is exactly the same message that John the Baptist was preaching. So there's not a, there, the, the difference, the difference is John is preaching repent for the kingdom of God is coming. Jesus is saying repent the king is here, all right? So that's, that's the difference. Now, he doesn't start out that way, but that's the, that's the essential difference between the two, John's preaching and Jesus' preaching as they come. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. There is nothing better than to see all of this in light of all of the rest of Scripture. I mean, yeah, Jesus lived an extraordinary life, he died a death for our, in our place, and he rose again. But that's just the nitty-gritty of the gospel, to see all of it, all of this fulfillment, all of this movement of Jesus' life is just incredible. It's, it's overwhelming almost because of what Jesus has done. So let's look at this sermon. Uh, <laughs> I could spend a year just on the sermon. We won't. We're gonna, I'm going to try to move through it fairly quickly. So I'm going to break the sermon down. Notice the Beatitudes. That's how he begins. Chapter number 5, verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. And so it's, it's hard to understand. In our minds, what we view is, are the crowds, Right? Even in, in, if you watch The Chosen, you saw all those people flocking to him to hear, the, to hear this Sermon on the Mount and all that stuff. And so in our imagination, we see this. But the Bible is specific that who he was teaching was his disciples. All right? So, and we're not, I don't think it's limited to 
12, uh, possibly all the 12 haven't even be, been assembled yet. We don't, we don't quite know all the order of things. I believe that this sermon was not just preached once. I believe he preached it over and over. I believe this is the sermon of the kingdom. I believe this is the, when he said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think this is the sermon that he preached it. I, I, I think uh, anybody that knows a preacher, any, you know that we have what we call sugar sticks, And it's a sermon that we have always, that we preach a lot, that if some church out somewhere else calls us and says, hey, come preach, we have it, it's ready, we preach it. I believe Jesus did the same thing. I think he had this sermon that he had been working on for his whole life, and that he bring, I think this is what he preached regularly. I think that's why the sermon on the plain that we have in, in Luke's gospel sounds a lot like it. I think it's because it's, it, I think that's what he preached over and over and over again. He, every town that he went, remember they didn't have YouTube, so the people in Syria couldn't, you know, couldn't look up on YouTube and see what Jesus preached last week. And so when he got to wherever he was going, he preached again. He, he preached the same sermon. That is just kind of the way that it happened. And so I believe this is that kind of sermon. I believe that initially, intentionally, it was for his disciples, those who were following him. I don't think this just means the apostles, the 12. I don't think it's limited to that. We know that there were ladies that followed him. We know that there were other people who weren't included in that that followed him. So I think this is bigger than just 12, but I don't think that this is for the crowds. I think this is for those, because it says he called, his, his disciples came to him, so he sat down. By the way, the other thing is, in tradition, that is, in, in the, as it was passed down from generation to generation, tradition, Jesus isn't at the top of a mountain. You know, we, we think that, that he is up top, um, really high up on the crest of this hill, and he's preaching. That's not what probably happened. In fact, Jesus was probably at the at the lower end of the uh, of this incline and his disciples were probably seated up higher than he was so they could hear him. His back was probably to the Sea of Galilee so that it would amplify. So he's got this this amplification system that God created, probably just so that he could preach this sermon. uh, It was this amplification system that he was preaching. However it happened, his disciples were now gathered around them, and he began like this, perhaps, arguably, the greatest sermon that has ever, ever been preached. And it started out like this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So that's how Jesus begins this Sermon on the Mount. By the way, in the way that Matthew compiled his accounting, the first real preaching that we hear from Jesus are the, the Beatitudes. Probably, if, if, depending on how you count, there was between seven and ten. There's ten blesseds, but there's really seven Beatitudes. Blessed are these kinds of people. And then he turns it and says, blessed are you, um, who, and, and ends that section. But anyway, however you count it, he begins with these blesseds, and at the end of the book of Matthew, in one of the last teachings of Jesus are the, are the eight woes or cursings on, on the Pharisees and, the, and those who are following after the Pharisaical religion. That's not by accident. Matthew didn't do, he just didn't stumble on to beginning with eight blesseds and in, or seven blesseds and ending with eight cursings. That, that's not by accident. And so you can see that as it flows throughout. What you're going to see is that the, um, 
the solidification of those who are following a man-made religion when they're faced with the Messiah that had been foretold of for centuries. And you're going to see them entrench themselves in that. Even, I mean, what would it take to believe in Jesus? A miracle? They saw it. Him to cast out demons? They saw it. Dead to be raised? They saw it. What would it take for somebody to believe in Jesus? Himself coming back from the dead? It happened. And yet they were still entrenched in their unbelief. And so that's, that's demonstrated throughout the book of Matthew as well. Again, one of those themes that I told you about a few weeks ago that, that Matthew is careful to include. Um, so we see these, this start with the, uh, with the Beatitudes. Uh, by the way, these, uh, these are not how you become a follower of Jesus. These are what a follower of Jesus looks like. This is what a follower of Jesus looks like. This is the fruit or the characteristic of a follower of Christ. Uh, we know that the only way that we become a follower of Christ is by grace through faith. We put our trust in Jesus. Um, Jesus goes on to talk about the disciples' role in the world. And I'm not going to preach the whole thing. Obviously, you know this. Um, you're the salt of the earth. Um, you're the light of the world. This is the way that we are to relate to the world, salt and light. We're to season it. We're to salt heals, salt savors, salt, um, salt preserves, all of these things. That's what we're to do in this world. We're to be the salt to the world. And if we lose our saltiness, if we don't accomplish that, Jesus said we ought to just be cast out and trampled under the, under the feet because we're not doing what we were supposed to do. We're not doing what we are here to do. And then uh, the light of the world, we don't hide our light, but we put, it on, we put it on a hill, we uncover it so that the world can see the light uh, that we are, which is really the proclamation of Jesus. And you see this, by the way, throughout all of Scripture, all of the New Testament for sure, um, this light, this witness that we are for Jesus is finally underscored in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Um, if they don't repent, remember Jesus is going to come and take away their witness, their light, their lampstand. He's going to remove their, their light. And so um, that's the picture. I, I almost prayed this earlier. I didn't. But um, one of our one of the difficulties that we have, because we, we love our churches so, we love our churches, the ones we grow up in, the ones that we were saved in, the ones that we have such great memories from. Our kids were born and, and dedicated and baptized, trusted Christ there, all that stuff. We have great memory. But, and I want to be really careful how I say this, when a church loses its effective witness for the Lord, it ought to die. It ought to die because it's a bad witness. It, 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 it becomes a detractor, a distraction from the kingdom. And so it ought to die. Now, obviously, the answer is don't lose your witness. Repent. And that's exactly what Revelation says. Repent. Turn away from, from building up yourself or squabbling or whatever it is that has caused you to lose your, your witness and come back to Christ so that he won't have to come and remove your lampstand. But it's a good thing in the kingdom's sake if those churches that aren't going to do that just die and go away. Yes, ma'am. I've heard the same thing said about people. <laughs> Elvis Presley was, was the one that that comment was made when he passed away. Because he was a godly man. He started off as a godly man, but towards the end he was afraid of death. Yeah. I don't know anything about Elvis, but um, I, I do know that, that I've heard it often said in two ways. One, that God, that God will remove you. Um, uh, if y'all remember, you've mentioned to me that you knew J. Harold Smith, that you were, you're related to him, Brother Jack. J. Harold Smith preached a great sermon, his famous sermon, Th God's Three Deadlines. And one of, those, one of those deadlines is that you've, you've outlived your, your witness on the earth, and God will take you home. Um, God will take you out. And I've also heard it said this way, and this is, this is a little bit more earthy 
and maybe crass way of saying it, but I've heard it said that church is about four funerals away from a revival. And, uh, and, that's, and that's what they mean, that God will take out people that are obstacles for, um, to his kingdom advance. And I don't, I don't say that lightly. This is serious business that we're talking about. And, um, uh, but it is. The, the Lord is going to do what he's going to do, and if we stand in his way for too long, he'll remove us. Um, and, and the Bible is just filled with those kinds of examples. So, yeah, that's, that's very good. And I didn't, I didn't repeat what you said, and I should have. So she said something very good, and I repeated it. So there we go. All right, so we see the disciples' role in the world. Uh, Jesus' relationship to the law, I'll sum it up this way. He did not come to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill it. And so then he, and I'll, I'll, that's the next section, he is going to show us the way that, that he fulfills the law. He clarifies it, and it's the rest of chapter 5. Uh, I'll just sum them up this way, and, and unless you have any questions about it. You shall not, you've heard it said, uh, you shall not commit murder, but I say unto you that anyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. And so... Basically, what Jesus is saying is he's fulfilling the law. He's saying, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit a murder. And by the way, everybody that hears him that's sitting there, they believe that. Everybody here today believes you shall not commit murder. That's just that we believe that. But what Jesus says, it is bigger than just your actions. It's also the condition of your heart. And so Jesus is getting, pardon the pun, to the heart of the matter. He's getting to the heart of the law. The law isn't just external. In fact, the new covenant is that the, heart, that the law isn't external, but rather it's internal. It'll be written on our hearts. And so this is what Jesus is showing us, that the law is not just external to us, but it's internal. And it's, and it's really more significant than they had ever, they ever thought. I'm going to tell you a joke, and, uh, and it's not really... Uh, there are really two examples. This isn't, uh, this isn't funny, except that it is. It's, it's in my own life. And, and when I was younger, it was, it was my pharisaical attitude trying to deal with God's law in my life. And so I said it two ways. I tried to deal with God's law with two ways. One, I said this, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. And so if somebody hits me, I'll turn the other cheek. But if they hit that one, it's on. I'm going to be after them. Well, that's not what it means at all. But that was just me trying to extend that external obedience to the law and not really allowing it to affect my heart. The second one is like unto it. Um, you know, covetousness is, is looking at something that somebody else has and saying, I want it. So what I always said was, I'll look at some, what somebody else has and says, I want one like it. So, so it won't be exactly the same thing. But that too is an external, that's an external attempt to circumvent the law. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. That's what the whole exercise of Judaism at that time was engaged in. They were engaged in trying to outwardly do the law, but inwardly not allowing it to affect their hearts. And Jesus is saying that you can't do it that way. It's your heart. It's what you believe on the inside. It's who you are here. In fact, Jesus says it throughout his ministry. He says, you know, what's on the inside comes out. Out of, out of the mouth, the man, the man professes. Uh, out of the mouth, it comes from the heart. It exposes what's in. In fact, he says it this way. It's not what a man takes in. It's not what you eat that defiles a man, but it's what's on the inside. And so this is, uh, in Matthew's use of the Sermon on the Mount, he is really showing all of Jesus' ministry. This is, this, is every, this, is, this is the constant refrain of Jesus' ministry all around this very sermon. It's the way that, it's the way that, followers of him were supposed to act 
in relation. I mean, my, the greatest one of this turn the other cheek, it, it always is what comes to my mind. They're in the garden. Jesus, the only innocent person, the only perfect person ever to live his whole life that way, never to sin, is getting arrested for blasphemy, for, for telling the truth. He's getting arrested. Peter, impetuous Peter, decides he's going to defend Jesus, and he pulls out his sword, and I love it, he cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. Now, he did not do it like this. <laughs> he probably did it like this, and dude ducked. And Jesus, knowing that he was still going to be arrested, knowing that he was still going to go to the cross, knowing that he was going to still be dead, reached down and picked up the ear and put it back on Malchus and healed him. <laughs> Man, you talk about curing the ringing in his ears. He probably never heard so clearly before in his life. And so all of Jesus' ministry is really summed up in the sermon. It really defines the sermon, the discernment, the, the discernment, the sermon is a narrative, a playlist, if you will, behind the actions of Jesus. It, it just runs in the background because this is who Jesus is, and this is who we're to be in him. So this, um, the law is clarified. Uh, it talks about worship practices in chapter 6. Don't pray like the Pharisees pray out in the open so everybody can see you. Um, but, uh, but go into your closet and pray there to the Lord. Uh, and and the, the baseline to this is if you do it for public accolades, that's all you're going to get. You may get public accolades, but you're not going to get the kingdom experience. You're not going to get the answers to those prayers. You're not going to get the relationship that builds on those prayers with, with the Father. All you're going to get is what you did in, in public. But if you go in secret and pray in secret, your Father will answer you and you'll be rewarded in heaven. And he does that not just for praying, but also for fasting and giving all throughout um, all throughout, all of the different practices of worship. And that's the first 18 verses of chapter, uh, of chapter 6. Any questions about any of that, the law or worship practices? Everybody get that? Yeah, I understand that if we got into every verse of the, of the Sermon on the Mount, we'd be here forever. Okay, I'm just trying to summarize this. Not that I'm opposed to it, but, uh, I mean, I love the Sermon on the Mount, but we don't have time. So, not, not in this setting. Uh, and then the priorities of the kingdom. Um, I, I want to read this just so you understand what I mean. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What Jesus has done in this, yes, he's talking about physical treasures, don't, don't store up physical treasures on the earth because he's about to go into this idea, this concept of uh, the Lord knows he'll, he'll give you everything you need, trust him, um, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. This is where he's moving. But this is a transitory statement because remember what Jesus has just said about praying and giving and fasting he said, whatever you do on the earth for attention is the extent of your blessing. But if you do it in secret to the Father, you're going to receive blessing from heaven. And so he takes this statement, don't lay up here on earth treasure. What he's doing is he's finishing that last section and he's transitioning to the next section about God taking care of us. And he's basically saying that we ought to live for all of those heavenly treasures, all of those future gifts from the Lord, and not be so overwhelmed or concentrated on the things of this world. 
Does everybody see that? So this is really a transition, this idea of these, uh, of these priorities of the kingdom. Um, one of my favorite verses uh, in Matthew is, is verse number 24. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Uh, but that truth, those, those are two different statements. He's making a great statement, a, a final statement, and then he's applying it to the point that he's making. The great statement, the overarching statement that's true all the time is, you can't serve two masters. You, whether it's wealth, he's not just limiting that statement to wealth. It's any other master. Our priorities have to be clear. They have to be clear. Um, I am a patriot, an American patriot. I love our nation. I love the founding of our nation. I believe that it was biblical. I believe that it was uh, for sure honorable. I believe all those things. I, I am a, a political man. Um, if you scratch very deep, you're going to hear some very strong statements that I believe are driven by Scripture that I hold to. But my goal is not to advance the republic. That's not what God has put us here for. Now, I'm grateful for it. But God has called us to build his kingdom. The kingdoms of this earth will pass away, even the good ones. But the kingdom of God will last forever. And so, the, now hear me, please understand. We all relate to this statement, no man can serve two masters. We all relate to this statement in our own ways. God has raised up, thankfully, over the centuries, godly politicians, godly leaders, godly people who have stepped in. That's not my calling. My calling is to make disciples and to, and to build the kingdom. Therefore, when I use my platform, which is our church's pulpit, I use it to build the kingdom. That doesn't mean I'm not interested or don't have strong beliefs about, um, about our republic. I do. I have very strong beliefs. But they have to be subordinate, especially in my proclamation of the gospel, they have to be subordinate in, in my life, in my priorities of life. And so for, I, I just take this as an opportunity to show you why I preach the way I do. It's not because I don't care. It's because I, ha I have to serve the Lord first. He has to be primary. And, and, and that's, that's binding on my conscience. That's who I have to be. There are others who have freedom, and so I, I don't look at, at another church or another pastor and say, hey, they're, they're missing the mark, because um, to your own master, you stand or fall. And so I have to stand to my master, and I, I will give an account, and I believe they will too, and I hope they give a good account. I hope that they're doing what's right. For me, I can't do it. I have to stand before the Lord and give an account for every word that's uttered. And it has to be right. It has to be right. Because a greater, a more severe, the King James says, a more severe judgment is held for the teacher. And so, and I take that seriously. And I don't want to be wrong. I don't want there ever be a time when I stand before God and he says, <laughs> your heart was good, but you're an idiot. I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I, the, um, in Romans, it says they had zeal, but without knowledge. And I don't want that. I want zeal with knowledge. I want to be held. So this is, this is one of those verses that guides my life. He, that's the great overarching statement. The, under, the, the, the specific statement, he, take, he goes from the greater to the specific, the greater to the lesser here, and he says, you cannot serve God and wealth. So now he's applying that, specific, that general statement to a specific situation. You can't serve both God and wealth. And that's true, you can't. If you are here to build up wealth on this earth, you will not, you'll, you'll not chase the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's not saying that you can't have wealth here on earth. There were the, the Bible, even in Jesus' ministry, he's surrounded by wealthy people who are serving him. And he's not saying, he's not telling them to renounce it. 
He's encouraging them to use it for his glory. And so the same is true. I've known some of the wealthiest people I've ever known have been Christians, and they honor the Lord Jesus with their, with their money and their wealth, and, all, and God just heaps it up more. He hasn't chosen to do that in my life. I don't know why. I'm, you know, I, maybe I can't be trusted with that. But, uh, but he, he knows I'll have a different color Corvette for every day of the week, I guess. You know, I'll have a stable full of those kinds of horses. And, and uh, you know, but uh, whatever the, these other people, the Lord just blesses. And I, I know them. I can name some names. And they just, they, and they just God just gives through them. And they just, they just give it. And he just keeps giving back to them. And they just, it's just, it's pretty neat to watch. So, uh, priorities of the kingdom. And then in chapter 7, he talks about self-examination and judgment. I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but I will say this. This does not mean what the world thinks it means. Um, I'll just read it to you. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, what our world likes to say is, do not judge. That's not what Jesus says. What Jesus says is, don't judge because you're going to be judged the same way that you do judge. And then he ends this, this little segment by saying, make some distinctions. Don't give what is holy to dogs. Don't cast your pearl before swine. Now, how can you do that unless you make some judgments on what's holy and what's pearls? So Jesus is not saying you can't make any judgment. What he is saying is, don't be a hypocrite. Don't do one thing for yourself and judge others because of what they're doing. He is saying, make sure that you are living in holiness before you make distinctions or try to correct other people. But listen, the Bible tells us all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, I mean, what do you think the prophets were doing? When, when the prophet, let me just take John the Baptist. John the Baptist walks up in front of Herod and says, what you're doing is wrong. Was he judging? Yes. Was he right? Yes. Was it God's word through him? Yes. So it doesn't mean we can't make distinctions about holy living or unholy living. I'm tired of hearing Christians say, well, we can't be the judge. <laughs> Robin, it reminds me of your, your uncle. Who can be the judge? <laughs> that's, what, that's what Robin tells me about one of his, one of his uncles. But, um, or who's to judge? But the Bible has, we're not to judge on our own. We're not to judge on our own. I, I don't compare you to me. That's not the standard. The standard is God's word. And I am not to open my mouth until I'm making sure I live according to his word. There is nothing more disgusting. <laughs> I used the word scuzzy about somebody earlier. There is nothing more disgusting than a preacher who doesn't live what he preaches. It's just, now we're all, none of us are perfect, obviously. And I'm telling you, you think, somebody told me this last week, pastor, these last two sermons you preached stepped all over me. I wish you'd stop. Well, I want you to know that the hour that you endure on a Sunday morning is nothing in comparison to the week that I have to spend preparing to preach it. Because the Lord is like, eh, what about that? Eh, what about that? Eh, what about that? And I'm telling you, there have been times that I am walking up to the pulpit that God says, eh, what about that? And I have to confess it before I preach. I don't confess it to you. Confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. And so I, I don't necessarily say it to you when I'm, but there are times, Lord, you know. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and, and that's true. The, so the truth is that 
that this is not saying we can't make distinctions about the world. It means that we can't make distinctions about the world when we've got more world in us than is in the world. That's his, that's his usage of the, of the plank and the speck. Um, I, I remember in, uh, um, the, I was in a, what what'd they call the BCM before it was the BCM? Baptist Collegiate Ministries. It was called the Baptist BSU, the Baptist Student Union. So I was, I was part of the Baptist Student Union at my first university that I was a part of. And, uh, and I remember this. I'll never forget this. They had a guy sitting on a stool, and he had, a, he had an eight-foot-long two-by-four that he had up to his eye like this. And it had a guy that was sitting across from him. And so he's holding this two-by-four. I mean, it's sticking out like that. And he's, he's moving it back and forth. And the guy on the stool across from him keeps ducking, and it keeps going over his head. And, and then he goes, oh, wait. Hey, hey, brother, wait a second. You got something in your eye. <laughs> and that's the picture. Jesus uses this idea of a plank and a speck. And that's what he's comparing it to. What he's saying is we have to deal with our own hearts, our own lives, our own hypocrisy before we ever try to deal with somebody else. But then he ends it by saying, don't give what's holy to dogs and don't throw your pearls before swine or they'll trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. He's saying you still have to make judgments, make distinctions, but you just have to do it from a heart that's pure before the Lord. You can't do it when you've got your, your own life filled up with junk. Does that make sense? All right, good. And the re- by the way, the rest of the New Testament corroborates that. I mean, Paul calls people by name. If it was wrong to make any kind of judgment about anybody, Paul wouldn't be able to do that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But Paul does it. Everything that Paul wrote is God's Word that we have, is God's Word. It's just that Paul did it in the right way. Therefore, we have to do it in the right way, too. Does that make sense? All right, good. Um, yes, uh, no, I wouldn't, uh, um, mm. yeah, yeah, so Jesus did tell them if they go into a city and the city wouldn't receive them, knock the dust off their feet and go on, so there is that, but, but I would say that, that salvation is not my job, it's, it's the Spirit's job, my job is just to be a billboard. And so I would, I would not say there's ever a time that you ought to just give up. Now, I would say there is a time that you uh, maybe change tactics or, or not be the constant. So I, I can see how somebody would use that, uh, that phrase as don't be, just don't be constantly giving it away, giving it away, giving it away. I think this is something a little different. Uh, I think this is, uh, G- so Jesus didn't give all the teachings of the kingdom to people who weren't going to hear. So that is true. And, and so I think it's akin to that. Um, don't spend your time, don't spend your time and effort trying to teach people who are unteachable. I think that I think that goes along with it. But that's good. That's good. All right. Um, uh, he keeps on, he finishes all this by telling us how to depend on the Father. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. So basically he's just saying trust the Lord. Depend on the Father for all that he gives to us. And then we have the golden rule. This, uh, this great statement um, where he says, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets is summed up by do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, a lot of philosophies, even that predate Jesus, a lot of philosophies had this written in the negative. Don't do to somebody what you wouldn't want them to do to you. Jesus actually puts it in the positive, though. Do to others. That doesn't, that means you just, you don't just avoid doing what what others, but you treat others. You engage with others the way that you want to be engaged. Do you want to be a friend? Then be a friend. I mean, you want to have a friend, be a friend. If you want people, people to take care of you in time of need, then you ought to take care of others in time of need. Uh, and, and so, and by the way, this isn't quid pro quo. We're like, Hey, if I do it for you now, you do it to me later. This is just, you ought to, you ought to treat everyone 
the way that you want anyone to treat you. It's the way that we live outwardly and openly before the Lord. So the golden rule, verse 12, uh, the route to destruction or life, verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are a few who find it. So uh, later on in, in the book of John, Jesus says, I am the gate. I'm the door. I am that way. And so this is it. He talks about kingdom citizens are known by their fruit. By the way, this is further example that he doesn't mean don't look at people's actions and assess their lives because he tells us to in verse 15, beware of the false prophets. Now, how in the world are you going to beware of false prophets if you don't judge their false prophecy? If you don't assess what they're saying. So, who comes to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves? You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So, then you will know them by their fruits. Um, and so, we... Uh, I'm not going to call any names because I don't want to get into trouble um, with any of you or with anybody watching on video, but all you have to do is look at ministries all around America, and you can judge people by their fruits. You can know whether what they're saying is true by how it affects their lives. That's the way that we are to know who to listen to. I told you earlier, there's nothing more disastrous or onerous or, I said scuzzy, uh, than a preacher who doesn't live by his own teaching. That's the way you know. That's what, that's what you know. So, you, you, look, if a, if a pastor doesn't demonstrate those things, you ought not to listen to him. If, if, I, if, if I live in a way that's not um, communicative of... of um, what I, what I preach, then I don't have a right to be heard. You know, I have no, there's no authority in what I say. Uh, it's why the greatest affirmation of, of my ministry is when Myra says he's the same guy in the pulpit that he is at home. There's no, uh, like, and I don't ask her to say that, like, and I, and so I try to keep just like, just like with the Lord, I try to keep my list short and uh, fessed up. And I tried to do that with Myra because, uh, you, you know, she knows me. She knows what I look like when I get mad. She knows what I look like when I had a bad day. She knows what I look like when I struggle. Uh, and, and so for her to still be encouraged by my preaching is, is really my greatest barometer of whether I'm living the life that I ought to live. Is she still on board with me? Because Myra is, above all, a person of integrity and uh, how does, how's, it use, how's the old saying, she don't brook no foolishness. <laughs> She's not going to put up with, uh, with a liar. And so, the, um, <laughs> so anyway, and that's putting it mildly. Jesus is, and then Jesus calls. He finishes all this by a call to obedience. And he does it through the, uh, through the picture of the, uh, the man who built his house on sand and the man who built himself on the rock. He, he who hears my words and does them, not believes them, and does them, is like a person who built their, their life on a rock um, and so that the, when the storm comes, their house will remain standing. The one who hears my words and doesn't do them is like one who builds their house on sand, and when the storm comes, the, the house falls, and great is its destruction, Jesus says. And so, he calls us to, to following his life, to obeying his life. Um, one aside, I think I'm just going to end here. I don't, I'm not going to go any further. Uh, I, I had a whole other section. We'll get to it next week. Um, one aside to this is all of Jesus's, not all of it, the flavor of the book of Proverbs runs throughout this sermon. It is uh, the idea of, um, of fruit, 
The idea of fools, fools and wise, foolish and wise runs throughout this. And so let me just remind you that the wise person is the one who knows God and follows him. The fool is the one, to quote the psalmist, who said in his heart, there is no God. So a fool is someone who is, to use our vernacular, not saved. And the wise person is the one who is saved, the one who walks with the Lord. And so the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed who hunger and, feed, and, hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the pure in spirit, or pure in heart, blessed are the meek, blessed are the, um, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, all of those are equivalent with the wise who builds his house on the rock. Okay, so they're the same. Jesus starts and ends with the same blessings. He just says it in different ways. Does that make sense? So, uh, so anyway, greatest sermon ever preached. If only I could preach a sermon like that. And so the only time I can is when I start out with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. When I read it, that, I mean, it's, it's the greatest sermon that's ever preached. All other sermons ought to point us to a life that receives this sermon and applies it and lives it. This is what it means to follow Jesus, to, to acknowledge the poor in spirit means that we're destitute. This word poverty is only used, this, this word for poverty is only used once other, one other time in the New Testament, and it's used when it talks about um, Lazarus and the rich man, and it said that Lazarus begged for bread under the table of the rich man. And so that's the way, the poor in spirit is the beggar, the one who says, God, I can't do this on my own. I need help. I need you. And the Lord Jesus offers us himself as that sustenance for our, our impoverished spirit. And so it all starts and ends with the Lord Jesus. All right. What are your questions about this first phase of the book of Matthew, which has taken me two weeks to do? Any questions? Does this make sense? Everybody good? Yeah, yeah. Dolly said that she, when she prays in the morning, she prays for God's wisdom and discernment, and that this idea of discernment is part of that, and it certainly is. Um, we ought to see the world through the lens of Scripture, through the lens. That it ought to become our worldview. Um, our, we're, we're born with a worldview, and it's our cultural worldview. And, but over time, as we give ourselves to the reading of the Word and the knowing of the Word, it ought to replace that original, natural, earthy, sinful worldview. And we ought to begin to see things through our own um, uh, biblical worldview. And so it, it's... It, um, we don't know... We aren't to know Scripture just for the sake of knowing Scripture. We're to know Scripture so it changes us and the way that we view all of the world. And, so the, and that's what Jesus was offering in the Sermon on the Mount. So absolutely, very good. That is discernment. Yeah, she said, uh, staff members said, we aren't to judge one another's salvation uh, but we're to be fruit inspectors. That's absolutely true. In fact, Paul, Paul said he didn't even judge his own salvation. Um, the, the, whole, the whole teaching I gave on assurance from 1 John on Wednesday nights is that same thing. We trust Jesus to save us. We put our faith in Jesus. But we look at our lives to see the fruit of Jesus in us. And if we aren't demonstrating that, we adjust our lives so that we begin to see that kinds of fruit. Um, just as, as another side to that, when Jesus said you aren't to call someone fool, that, that word fool really is, was synonymous with a, 
a God hater, a lost person. And so that's the idea of judging someone's salvation. We aren't to judge someone's salvation to say, hey, you're not saved. You can't be saved. You're, you know, we can't say that because we don't know a person's heart. I can't look into somebody's heart. I was talking with one of our church members this morning over breakfast, and he said there's two, I'd never heard it this way, there's two things you can't look into. You can't look into a man's pocketbook, and what he means is you can't really know how much a person has just by looking at them, and you can't know whether somebody's saved just by looking at them. But what we can do is we can look at the fruit in their lives and call out warnings to them and say, hey, you're headed in the wrong direction. And that is absolutely true. That, that's, a, that's a good word. And that's, so we don't judge whether someone's saved or not. What we do is we call them to repentance. We, we look at the fruits of their lives and say, that you can't keep living like this. You need to come back. Does that make sense? That's good. Thanks for reminding me of that. That's a good point. Anybody else? All right. God bless you. If you pray for me on Thursdays, and I don't know any of you do, but if you do pray for me on Thursdays, pray for Meyer and I. We are making a quick trip out of town tonight, and we'll be back tomorrow. Pray for traveling mercies um, and, uh, and pray for patience on the road, and I don't necessarily mean mine. Um, so uh, pray that the Lord will allow us to get to uh, where we're headed and back okay. And, uh, and so if you pray for us, pray for that. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great day.